Class number three, and we're going to begin Ricardo. But before we do that, I want to uh, go back to some of the points in Smith to remind you that Ricardo is picking up on Smith, is elaborating on Smith, and correcting Smith. Uh, but before I get to the Ricardo aspect of it, I want to uh, elaborate on something which I left, I think, a little bit unclear in the attempt to compress all of Smith into one lecture. Uh, and that was the, the uh, uh, ambiguity that Smith introduces in the definition of production and non-production labor, or as he calls it, productive and unproductive labor, an ambiguity which exists in Smith's own argument. Let me remind you that what Smith says in the beginning is that labor is the source of new wealth. Because labor as the active subject uses tools and works with land and the environment to produce new wealth. So from this point of view, the definition of production labor is labor which is related to, is a definition which is related to the use value produced by labor. Right? And that's the aspect that I emphasized last time, uh, the, because uh, in my opinion, that's the, the general aspect. But it is known that Smith slips into another aspect of labor, which is not identical to that. And that raises a question of an alternate interpretation. And that is when he says, a man grows rich by employing uh, uh, laborers, but he grows poor by employing servants. And the reason, he says, is that a servant adds, does not add to the value of anything. Now, value is different from use value. Value has to do with uh, exchangeable aspect, with uh, money. And so Smith has now introduced what seems like the same distinction, the same thing elaborated differently, but is actually a different definition. Because it becomes clear that we could then say that something which does not add to use value would be, by the first definition, non-production labor, unproductive labor in the sense of Smith. Uh, for instance, wholesale retail labor which circulates goods but doesn't add to them. In fact, generally you lose a little bit in the circulation process, but you also have to use some goods to support the circulation process. So that's the aspect that I emphasized. But the second aspect of Smith that says, well, it's equivalent to something adding value becomes clearly not the same when you compare manufacturer to wholesale retailer. Because in the first definition, the manufacturer is adding to the wealth of the society, and the wholesaler retailer is circulating this wealth, trading it to be selling it for money to people who give money for it. So it's circulating from a social point of view. But in the second definition of value added, both the manufacturer and the wholesaler retailer get more money at the end than then they started, so they have a value added. And therefore, by the second definition, both are productive labor. Does everybody follow that? Is that clear? Should I go over that again? Yes? No? Yes? So basically, Marx wasn't the first one to make the distinction between value and use value. It was Smith, 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 Smith. That's already in Smith, yes. And in fact, it's in Ricardo also. We're going to come to that. But uh, Smith and Ricardo both uh, start off with the distinction between use value and value. And then Ricardo and Smith both say unambiguously, it seems, that uh, labor which is productive is labor which adds to use value. And then slip into the other. Now, the two overlap, but not completely. And one could view them as either uh, contradictory definitions or a contradiction in Smith's definition. But here's the significance of this. If I define productive, unproductive labor from the point of view of anything adds value, 
then every capitalist's labor is productive. And this is the aspect which neoclassical theory picks up on from Smith. And it, it rightfully claims it's in Smith, but it ignores the other definition, which is of use value. Okay? So if you say that everything is productive, uh, which adds to value, then even non-capitalist labor, as long as it's market labor, adds to value. So from this point of view, in Smith, Wholesale retail, in Smith's first definition, wholesale retail trade is non-unproductive labor, and so is the state. In the neoclassical uh, definition, wholesale retail labor is productive labor because it adds to value, but the state isn't because it's not market labor. And that's why typically in the neoclassical tradition, the state is not viewed as uh, productive labor. And in fact, many conservatives actually refer to the state in terms which are equivalent to or sometimes actually say this is labor which is not productive. Yes? Does it change how the cost of production is calculated? As in, um, cost of production becomes greater as uh, profit comes less? No. Uh, let me just repeat that because not everybody can hear it. The question was, uh, does this change how the cost of production is uh, it depends how you define production, obviously. But if you mean the cost of the sale of the good, then both everybody would agree, Smith, Ricardo, and Marx, that the cost of the good in the end includes the cost of the wholesale retail. Uh, I mean, sorry, the cost of the producer. That's the producer. It's called in national income accounts the producer cost. But if that good is also then sold through a wholesale retailer to the consumer, then the price of the good includes the cost of selling plus the profit of selling. That's quite different from saying that the good is more when it's sold. It's quite different from saying its price is more and that the quantity of the good is more. If you count the wholesale retail activity as adding to the wealth of the society, then in some sense, the society's wealth consists of the produced goods plus services, which are circulation services. And that's how modern national income accounts would count uh, wholesale retail, as the addition of new wealth in the form of services. Whereas in Smith's first definition, this is the, uh, not an addition of new wealth. It is rather a use of the wealth for the activity of circulation. And remember the example that I used of, of the defending a village against m marauders. Do we add the act, the defense services, that is of Ewell Brinner and his six other uh, thugs uh, who are defending the, the village against worst um, people, do we count the wealth of the society as greater once they've hired the Magnificent Seven? Or do we say that that wealth is being diverted or used to protect itself from uh, an even worse outcome, which is that more wealth would be taken by uh, the the marauding gang of, of uh, raiders which are there. Do everybody remember the example? I don't know how many people went back and watched Magnificent Seven. You'd have to sit through the whole thing, but uh, the principle is there. If you want to watch Rashomon, you can see the same thing. Uh, no, the Seven Samurai. Sorry, Seven Samurai. It's the same thing. Uh, and this is not a trivial issue in the modern world because this boils down to something different, which is what do we say about the huge expansion of the state and of the military, let's say, to give an example, and of the international expansion of finance activities and wholesale retail activities. Are these adding to the wealth or are they distributing, say, the wealth or the income from that wealth? Now, Smith obviously doesn't follow this up and he has two conflicting definitions. Ricardo seems to hew to the first definition, Marx certainly to the first one rather than the second. But the uh, dominant tradition in economics picks up the second definition and says all market activity is productive, which has the great virtue that the market cannot be unproductive. Anything involved in the market is by definition productive. And the explanation given is, well, if people didn't want it, they wouldn't pay for it. But Smith's argument is not about whether people want it or not. It's the question of whether it's an addition objective addition to the wealth of the society or a consumption of that wealth for other desired ends.
such as those of supporting the king, supporting the military, supporting the state. Now, Smith is not saying that unproductive labor is bad. And the term unproductive, I prefer the term production, non-production labor, or production versus social consumption, because this removes the stigma of the term unproductive. OK? There's just a touch base on this question. It'll pop up again. Any questions about that? Are you feeling unproductive right now? So. <laughs> OK? Second, OK. The second point I made at the end was to talk about Smith's uh, quite startling quote about the conflict of interest among classes. Now notice this is already very important because, again, neoclassical theory eliminates this whole problem by making capital into a servant of the consumer, positing that capital is a servant. But Smith is quite clear that he says that the interests of producers and what he calls traders are not the interests of society as a whole. And they, they should not be taken at face value, should not be trusted, should be examined with the greatest care. Now that's interesting because you cannot find that built into modern economics at all, where the interests all mesh to the greater good of the consumer. And that's a deliberate. Uh, transformation of the vision of capitalism from which there's conflict in the classical tradition between labor and capital. Wages rise, profits go down, other things being equal. Rents rise, profits go down. Profits take more of, than rents go down. So this struggle is always imminent in the distinction that there are three classes of income related to three classes of the population. And of course, Smith talks about the unequal power of these classes. So power is also built in from the beginning. Um, and those things all disappear from orthodox economics, deliberately. Because the purpose of orthodox economics, I would argue, is to represent capitalism as a harmonious system, which is ideal in some sense. Now That brings me to the third point. You notice from the argument in the falling rate of profit in Smith, that the system drives itself to a point where the rate of profit is low. And since profitability drives growth, the system drives itself to a point where it stagnates as a historical mode of production. Not, he's not talking about one country. He's talking about capitalism per se stagnates. And this brings up a very important point, again, in the classical tradition. They were quite aware that capitalism was a particular form of society, what Marx will call a mode of production. But it's a form of society. It's not a universal. Smith may sometimes make it seem as if every society has people wishing to break out into capitalism. But yet, his own logic leads him to a point where the system becomes stagnant. So what happens when the system is stagnant? Well, if there's no growth, then the thing that keeps wages rising disappears. And though Smith doesn't go to Malthus's part, you can already find in Smith references to the fact that societies which are stagnant, the condition of labor falls to a very low level. Landlords will have rent, but they will not have any rising rent. And capitalists will be reduced to the minimal level because profitability does not warrant any expansion, because it's low. So this is what I call the heat death of capitalism. It runs out of energy. And Smith does not elaborate on the implications of that. But what is interesting is Ricardo is going to pick up on the same theme of a falling rate of profit. And he's going to come to the same end point, which is a point where profitability is such that the system cannot grow. It's essentially stagnant. And again, he doesn't say anything about what that implies. Now, Marx is also going to pick up on this falling rate of profit. And we don't know what his conclusion is, because unlike Smith and Ricardo, Marx never got around to writing most of what he intended to do in public form. And this is a point I'm going to repeat again and again. What we have from Marx is largely what he never got around to publishing, put together by Engels. We have only one volume of Capital published by Marx. And Previously, uh, yeah, some other publications here and there. But the main work 
was unfinished, scattered in bits and pieces, and so it's wonderfully open to interpretation and reinterpretation and conflict, and therefore Marx provides employment for thousands of academics <laughs> ever since. There's plenty of stuff you can do there wandering around. Uh, but I'm going to ask you to read it carefully to see that it's not so in, indeterminate as it may seem. Yes? When you say extension will be limited, are you talking about expansion of wealth? And in that case, what about expansion of finance capital? Well, it's a good question because Smith doesn't answer that question, but let's see if we can tease out from the logic of his argument on the chapter of accumulation, right? Just because there is more labor growing doesn't mean that there'll be more employment. Because nothing in Smith says that labor will be employed just because it's there. Labor will be employed because if it lowers the wage, it becomes more profitable, or if profitability is such that growth is picking it up. So now, if we follow the logic of that, if the population continues to grow, and there is no growth, then labor will be reduced to the most miserable of conditions, which is just surviving on the margin, as population will then itself go into the Malthusian loop. It's implicit in Smith, it's not explicit, right? L landlords presumably would have some ownership of the land. Smith doesn't discuss in great detail, but they would be the beneficiaries of this because their wealth would be insured by that. But it's not clear what capitalists will be doing if profitability is so low that it doesn't pay to not only grow, but perhaps not be capitalists altogether. So it suggests the possibility of the collapse of the mode of production. It's historical end. And Smith is not a revolutionary in, in the sense of anti-capitalist, but he is a revolutionary in the sense of understanding that capitalism has properties which no other mode of production has. And Ricardo also comes close to this, and he is more reliant on Malthus for the wages part. So that's a very interesting paper topic. What does the stationary state, as it's called, the state, imply for social conditions in capitalism? And what does it imply for something else? I mean, labor is largely passive in, in Smith and Ricardo, it's not an active subject. Obviously, Marx is the one who makes it into the big active subject. But what does it imply in Smith and Ricardo? And if you really, I'd advise you not to try also that same thing for Marx. Do it instead if you want, because it, it's a big topic. But it's a very interesting topic. I saw a hand, yes. What, what can a capitalist do in, in America today? What would be the possibilities? <laughs> given the certain circumstances? I, I'm not sure we can jump from Smith to America today, but if, if, if we could, it would be on a world scale, because his argument is about capitalism per se, not England. And he's looking ahead to the, what he finds to be the logical conclusion of the, uh, the laws of the system, which is including a declining profit rate. But he doesn't say anything more. I mean, it's an enormous work. It took him a great length of time to do it. And people pore over one sentence there, trying to figure out meanings and inter implications of it. It's a, it's a work of genius. But uh, it, that part is not allowed. Uh, let's say, given the certain of, um, of, let's say, international mergers and acquisitions, and generally the accumulation of profits in a small sector of society or certain corporations, um, or certain sectors, let's say, what would be the productive possibilities of any capitalist if they're not, let's say, within the co within corporate finance or within... But as Smith is not talking about it. He's talking about the fact that profitability has reached such a point that uh, capitalists uh, do not have any incentive to grow in the, in the global sense, in the aggregate sense, not individual capitalists. He's talking about capitalist society. Now, that is a question very hard to answer because he's not imagining the world as we live in today. But we can certainly say this, in moments of crisis, profitability falls to zero or negative. And we know exactly what happens. The unemployment rises, bankruptcies rise, the conflict among capitalists rises sharply. Uh, across on a global scale, we're witnessing it across the world right now. What would that mean if that was a permanent condition? Or could it be a permanent condition? Well, in Smith's idea, it could be a permanent condition because there's no room for wages to be reduced because they're already uh, only a, a, 
uh, above the basic level due to growth. So they will fall back to the basic level. How long this would take, he doesn't say. But if they would fall back to the basic level, that would not prevent some group in the capitalist society like the landlords and the surviving capitalists from being well wealthy, but the system wouldn't be dynamic. I, I think the answer is a movie, if you've seen it, Elysium recently. <laughs> go, go take a look at that movie. That's essentially a projection of that Smithian state. Maybe they, they read Smith, I don't know. Any other questions? Yes. So it's not looking at it like if uh, the market comes to the halt, it doesn't seem like with time it's going to equalize itself to the minimum and pick up again from there. Ah, oh, well, that's an interesting question. Where would it pick up from if wages were, couldn't go any lower? Um, and if competition, if, if, if growth of wealth was reducing the profit rate, which is very fundamental to Smith's argument, then picking up would make the profit rate go down. So where would it pick up? It would have to get, as we now say in modern economics, an exogenous increase in the profit rate. But that would be temporary, because if you did that, it would grow. If it would grow, the profit rate would come down. So there's no obvious escape from this. Marx is going to disagree with this. He's going to disagree with Ricardo on these specific points. But it's interesting that all of them imply a falling rate of profit. It's very unclear what the end of that process is. Um, and many people have written about it, Rosa Luxemburg and, uh, in the Marxist tradition, about these end states. Do they imply revolution? Do they imply some uh, new process of raising profitability and where and how? But I don't want to lay that burden on Smith. I just want to point out that it's very, very interesting that it's there. And it comes, remember, it comes from Smith because he is true to the logic of his own argument. It doesn't come because he hates capitalism. On the contrary, he's the greatest proponent in economics of the power and, and strength and historical uh, progressiveness of capitalism. It comes because his own logic leads him to this conclusion. Same for Ricardo. Yes. I'm a confused. If wagering and profit rate is correlated and the population is growing, and Smith doesn't elaborate on that. And one can't ask Smith to do everything. He's done a lot already. But this is the issue that comes up in Malthus and Ricardo. And we're going to come back to that. But it's implicit in Smith that the population is a kind of passive variable. And the wage comes about because it's a mixture of the population, which he sort of implicitly takes as not threatening accumulation, but ongoing. And as long as accumulation is proceeding, then uh, implicit in Smith is proceeding faster than population growth. But population growth is a relatively new phenomenon, by the way. I mean, most people just uh, died very young. So it wasn't a big issue there. So you can imagine the population is sort of a growing at some rate well below accumulation. Then accumulation is raising the wage because it's raising the demand for labor. And Smith is, argues, in effect, saying that the conditions of labor are better when there's more growth. But as growth stagnates, then the conditions of labor will sink back down to the minimum because any growth in labor is now greater than the growth of capital. So you have pressure, and that means at some point that labor cannot grow. He doesn't elaborate on That's Malthus. Malthus picks up on that aspect. And don't forget that Malthus, of course, has read Smith. So it's not like it comes out of the air. What's striking to me when I read Smith every year, as I have to do every year to teach this course, is how relevant some of these questions are. You know, The sign of greatness is not the specificity of the exact answer, but the importance of the question. It's the question which is so fundamental. OK. Third point. If this issue of the conflict of interest is there in Smith, then clearly the definition of interest and of behavioral modes is different from the neoclassical idea that every entity seeks to maximize its own gain and ends up with capitalism serving, best of all, utility of the consumer. And notice that in Smith, you don't see any reference to optimality. 
you see a kind of incentive structure. But an incentive structure is not the same thing as what I would call hyper-rationality, which is what you have in orthodox economics today. Hyper-rationality in the sense that it is an all-consuming, in fact, literally all-consuming, project of every agent to seek the maximum good they can, defined in terms of either utility or profit, with perfect knowledge of the future and all of that, and of the present, by the way, and implicitly of the past, so they can achieve this goal. Uh, Smith talks about the exercise of reason. And even that, as you can see in those passages that we read, you have to be careful that the reason can be used for the uh, individual good and not the social good. Right? So the reason is not, by definition, good for everybody. It can be a class reason, which is one of the points he was making in that section. And people don't pay attention when they read Smith about that. So this notion of hyper-rationality, which is uh, standard in neoclassical, everybody's had micro, everybody's lived through micro, so you know what I'm talking about there, uh, is very interesting because you have to ask exactly what everybody does when they first encounter micro, which is, are you kidding? And then after a couple of years, you forget that. And then you start you know, drawing the curves and writing the conditions, and you completely forget the whole issue, forget the question. But it isn't in Smith. He doesn't talk about the consumer in any way as uh, maximizing some kind of utility or uh, reaching some kind of highest level of satisfaction. In fact, even reason doesn't play much of a role, but I would argue that it's implicit in the following sense. That all the classical tradition, and beginning with Smith, it, the idea of the invisible hand is that it stems from an incentive structure which does not require each individual to embody that structure, but rather that there be a collective movement in the direction of a greater incentive, a better incentive. Now, what do I mean by that? If I were to say that uh, this side of the room has higher wages than the other side of the room, it doesn't follow that everybody on this low-wage side will migrate over to the high-wage side. Or indeed, it doesn't follow that the people on the high-wage side will stay on the high-wage side. They move, may move over. It doesn't even follow that they, most of them are aware of it. For the classical thing, all you need for the idea of, say, wage equalization is some drift from the low-wage side to the high-wage side in net. In net. It does not require that every agent calculates how to get over there and how to get out of there or whatever. It just requires some drift. And this is interesting because in, in models in biology or even in physics, if you open up a, a, a window in a, in a container of gas, some of the molecules will leak out. In this case, the molecules don't say, aha, window, I'm going to get out of here they leak out because they happen to be passing in the area and their trajectory takes them out. In the biological sense, all species have developed some mechanism for seeking out food. It doesn't mean that if there's more food here and less food here, that everybody will drop everything and run over, but you'll expect some ants will wander over in that direction and get rewarded by it. And this is an important point, the feedback, positive feedback aspect. And so therefore, there'll be some incentive uh, in, the, in the collective sense, some migration in the direction of the higher uh, food supply. In that same sense, capitalists in Smith are not simply all knowing and hyper-rational. All that's necessary for the argument of profit rate equalization is that if there's a low profit rate sector and a high profit rate sector, there tends to be greater entry of new capital or more investment by old capital in the higher wage profit rate sector. 
And this is something that's easily amenable to agent-based simulation, which is a now a modern tool, quite useful, because you can have agents who don't know everything, but may have some uh, tendency in a certain direction, and therefore you can get more of them in a place where there's a higher return of some sort. Same thing for consumers and prices. If uh, prices are high here and they're low here for the same product, it doesn't follow that everybody's going to rush over there. You don't need to say that. All you need to say is that there'll be a tendency for people to seek out the lower prices or discover the lower prices and transmit that information back. And therefore, some people will take advantage of it. And that'll put pressure on the producers of the higher prices because you're going to lose some cus customers and the people with the lower prices are going to gain some consumers and that's going to create a feedback loop, an incentive, right? So uh, this is a different vision. Uh, it's not tied to hyper-rationality at all. And it's a, a totally a mistake, in my opinion, to project Smith onto uh, marginal utility theory or to Walra because that's essentially removing the real content or removing much of the real content in the process. Any questions about that? Okay. A, a related point, which I'm not going to elaborate on here, but uh, since you will undoubtedly take more courses in economics, is, is why then if in the classical tradition you don't need this hyper-rationality, you don't have it, uh, why is it then become necessary in economics to introduce it? What motivated uh, the rise of the notion that every individual is a maximizer with the perfect ability to achieve? her or his goals, or its goals, because we're talking about the firm also here. What drove that? And the neoclassical answer is greater rigor, because they were able to formalize it in mathematically. But you can formalize exactly the other. And it's surprising, in fact, because biology already has another notion. Uh, Darwin doesn't say that evolution is driven by the hyper-rationality of animals. On the contrary, it's a feedback mechanism, a uh, mechanism that winnows the ones who make the wrong decision away and, and uh, um, enhances the survival possibilities of the ones that, for whatever reason, maybe accidentally get the right decision, or the decision which is right in that environment, or a decision which is more rewarding in that environment, and so on. So you didn't need, already from Darwin, any idea of hyper-rationality. It's not true that ants are actually little tiny game theorists. Not true for people either. Certainly not for game theorists who are not very good game theorists, but in their personal life. So why, why do you need this? It's a good paper topic, by the way. Why does the new way of looking of capitalism at capitalism come up? at a time when classic economics had already been a quite powerful apparatus. Yeah. Perhaps there is a certain accumulation of wealth in this production to this. There is perhaps uh, more, cons more in the distribution circle rather than the actual production services. So but why would that require you to idealize the system? Why not analyze it like a biologist and say, look, some animals, like dinosaurs, don't make it. Others do. Yes? Because if you find fault with it, you might start thinking about better ways to do it. I'm sorry, say that again. If you find faults with it, you might start thinking about better ways to organize things. Yes, but then they don't find fault with it. That's the point. The neoclassical tradition essentially makes it into a perfect system. So that's what I mean, so that they don't have to ever have to think about the question of alternatives. Ah, OK, I see. So yes, that's a. a, a a very good possible answer is that this was a, a way to block off the question of going beyond capitalism. Now notice that question is implicit in the idea of a stationary state, which is, by Smith's own argument, a terrible place to be. It's not benign, it's malign. And that would then raise the question of if this is where the system is heading, why do we uh, 
want to tolerate a system that's going to bring us to this. Uh, are there? Yes. Develop before statistics? I, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. You have to speak. Does calculus develop before statistics? OK, so this is the neoclassical answer, is that it, it was driven by uh, calculus, mathematics, right? And if that's the case, interesting question, why does mathematics have to imply uh, this vision? I'm saying because statistics were, like distributions didn't really exist when it was kind of in its infancy. Well, that's an interesting answer, but let me try to argue that it doesn't work because biology was also extant. Darwin was also there on the scene, so to speak, and biologists did not move to this optimality just because calculus was around, which was also around, by the way. Uh, indeed, what's interesting, this is a complete digression, but as, as I tell you, I love digression. So um, Marx was very interested and studied calculus, took up calculus, like any educated European. He had studied mathematics to some extent, but he actually went to study calculus because he was interested in the use of calculus to study business cycles, which he had read. And so here's another use of calculus, not the optimizing use, but the nonlinear dynamics side of it, right? That part didn't get picked up by orthodox economics till very, very much later. What got picked up was that part of the calculus that fit the vision, so to speak. And I would argue the vision was, in fact, as was pointed out, was because it was a means of uh, shifting attention away from the critique of the system. Uh, at the time that neoclassic economics begins to arise, there's also a big fervent discussion of utopian socialism and socialism in general, in, long before Marx, by the way. I mean, they were Ricardian socialists. And they were talking about how capitalism had to be superseded and constructing visions of that. And uh, it's quite striking that this move comes as, uh, at, as a means of sort of protecting the vision of capitalism. I think of it, I call it the great digression, but you might consider this as a paper topic. What were the political and social circumstances in which this vision comes to rise? Yeah. There's also there was an interesting article, I think it was on the nation um, by Corey Robin um, about, it kind of traced the genealogy of this, like, well, actually it was like Austrian economics, but it's more or less in the same vein. I uh, traced it from Nietzsche and his, his notion of like the Ubermensch and, um, and his reaction against uh, socialism. Uh, it sounds very interesting. I would like to. Um... To, if you could send that to me, I'd like to see that. I think this is an underexplored topic uh, about the historical and social drivers and motivation. One can see, by the way, the obvious point. If you present capitalism as ideal, then you don't have any reason to think about any system beyond capitalism because it's already ideal. What you want to do is get to the closest to that ideal by making it, uh, removing those things which interfere with the perfection of the system. One could count that as a, one of the driving forces of neoliberalism. So have more markets, more institutions that are quote unquote market friendly, flexible labor markets, which is of course very good for um, businesses. You can hire and fire people with much greater ease. And the uh, and, uh, adaptation of social, institutional, cultural values to fit the market model. And that is the explicit agenda of neoliberalism since the 1980s in, in the world today. But it is tied to this theoretical model. And my point here is that that theoretical model is not the same thing as a classical model. So when we're going back, reading the originators of economics, keep in mind that there was also not just a continuation of some questions, but a break into a different paradigm. I saw a hand somewhere, yes. Just um, on your digression about the, re the relationship between, the, or the analogy between this and Darwin, was when Darwin published his paper, he wasn't received entirely as accepted. There was the Lamarckian tradition of evolution, which persisted for many, many generations, well, I don't know about generations, but decades and decades until eventually that was proven wrong. And even today, a lot of people, for various reasons, don't believe in Darwinian evolution. Absolutely. In fact, that's a very good point because here I said, well, Darwin wasn't converted into 
optimality and so on. But actually, you're absolutely right that Darwin is converted or opposed by an optimal vision of biology. But it's not the optimality of the individual agent. It's optimality of someone else. Creationism, right? It's God's plan, God's will, God's rationality, and God's foresight. It's very interesting, uh, parallel and, and difference, because in the neoclassical model, every individual is God, hyper-rational, perfectly knowing, and so on. Whereas in religion, that would be somewhat problematic, in most religions anyway. So you have here God's plan, and the opposition to Darwin comes from the claim that you can derive from this religious foundation explanation of what we find scientifically. Okay. Anyway, as I said, this is a digression, but I, it's a very interesting digression, which is a paradigm shift. Okay. I, I, I mentioned once again that I, when I started this class, I told you that I was interested in understanding the classicals not as history of economic thought, but as an alternate foundation of economic thought. And so then this paradigm shift issue becomes very crucial. Because if there was a shift to a paradigm which celebrates capitalism, it's a different paradigm than a paradigm that analyzes capitalism and can see uh, end results which are not particularly uh, enticing, then that's something to keep in mind. It may not get you a job, but it'll be interesting in itself. Okay. So this idea of partial shifts of, of, of movements in the direction of something that is higher wage, lower price, higher profit rate, without some notion that you can, uh, everybody will do it, every agent will do it, or every agent will even notice it. Uh, and if they do do it, they'll do it properly, implies and carries with it the idea in, in, in the classical tradition of the notion of natural price as a regulator of market price. Smith uses the term natural price. Natural price is that price which is, forms the center of gravity of market price. But I want to remind you what that means. If I and I think I did this last time, but just to remind you again, if this is time, and this is the natural price, this price is never there. It never observed. It's a theoretical argument for something that regulates market prices. What are you going to observe? According to Smith's argument, you're going to observe a market price and the natural price is actually hidden. You'll never see it. But you will see its effects in the path of the actual price. Not in the immediate path, but in the fact that it's center of gravity, a moving center of gravity, is dragging it in a direction or not. And this is again a thing to keep in mind because this is a Ricardo's starting point, where we're starting today. Ricardo says, well, remember that we're talking about natural prices, the prices which are the centers of gravity of market prices, not market prices. And that raises the question of why a natural price is a natural price. I mean, why does the market price not stay where it is? So let me just remind you. If the market price reflects demand and supply, then in, it would seem that that price is fine because it reflects demand and supply, right? It's, a, it's the uh, uh, result of demand confronting supply or supply confronting demand. So it is what it is. So why should it be anything different? And the answer is, well, demand could change or supply could change. Well, that's true. And classical economists start from that. But they make a further argument that supply, and in 
in, implicitly than effects of supply on demand will mean that the, whatever outcome you have, let's suppose that demand and supply created this outcome, point A. Why is this outcome not just stay there? Well, the broad answer is demand and supply change. But the classical answer is because that point is not sustainable. And it's not sustainable because something about it makes it different than the natural price. And the natural price is a sustainable, not in the sense that you'll be there, but the gravitational attractor. Now, what does that mean? Suppose that we have uh, here uh, a sector with a high profit rate. And here, a sector with a low profit rate. What does that mean? The price is high here relative to its costs, and it's low here relative to its costs. Then in the same sense there is, uh, that we were talking about before, there will be some migration of capital, either because some people will leave here and enter, or people here will invest more rapidly. But the main point is that if the profit rate is higher than the average, then supply will grow faster than the average, and actually than the demand in the industry. If it's lower than the average here, the profit rate, then supply will grow less rapidly. But what's a consequence of that? If supply grows more rapidly relative to demand, the price is going to be pushed down. So that's the situation where you are at point A, that supply and demand are equal, but the profit rate is higher than the normal profit rate. Another way to put that is the price is higher than the price that would give you the normal profit rate. And that's a natural price. So conditions uh, automatically, the reaction of the su suppliers and consumers and all of that will be to drive the price down. Now, there's nothing that says the price will just stop here. It's going to be driven in that direction, but it can certainly be driven past it. Precisely because there's no hyper-rationality, there's no universal agent, there's no single representative agent. It's a collectivity responding to signals and incentives and most likely stampeding when the thing gets going. So you get driven past and you come, this is point B, and now you end up at point C. But in point C, the profit rate is now below the average rate and the opposite movement takes place. Supply shrinks relative to demand, price rises, and you move in this direction, and so on. So you don't have any reason to suppose, and indeed a strong reason to not suppose, that there is some kind of uh, state of rest. To put it differently, what the classical tradition is, is um, describing is a process of turbulent equilibration. So this is turbulent and you can uh, I can actually uh, provide for you quotes in Smith and Ricardo and certainly in Marx exactly that say this price is never at the natural price but it is driven towards it and then if it goes beyond it's driven back up and the opposite so this is the classical idea but you also have the neoclassical idea, which is different, which is typically a static vision. So the equilibrium price is there. And the market price starts off at A. And it moves smoothly to this. Or possibly it starts off at B. And it moves perhaps like this, but eventually it arrives at the equilibrium price. This is the notion of equilibrium as a state of existence, as opposed to equilibrium as a, uh, as a equilibration as a turbulent process. Now, obviously this is a non-trivial distinction because if you were doing empirical work, and you observed profit rates, you will see that they're not equal. The dual of this 
I said this is price, but I could equally well write this as the profit rate of sector, I, and this is the average profit rate. The same logic applies. I could write this as the wage of some particular set of workers, and this, or the average wage, and this is the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, of a set of workers, and this is the average wage, right? So I can speak of this in, in general terms, and the main point is that I don't expect uh, at any moment that the actual price will be standing still, will be peaceful, will be at equilibrium. I don't interpret the actual price as an equilibrium price empirically. Therefore, if I find that actual profit rates are different, I will not be shocked because I expect them to be different. On the other hand, if I believe in this, I would expect that actual profit rates will either not be different because we are here, or they will converge to the same number. Now, this is exactly the difference in the empirical literature about looking at profit rates. The most modern, mathematically and econometrically inclined is driven by the difference in these two conceptions, not by the econometrics, not by the data, because we all use the same data. Okay? And I, I need you to keep that in mind throughout, because this issue will become the classicals will focus now on the properties of this natural price. That's what we're going to get to now. And that makes it seem as if the actual price is at the natural price. But they are careful to say, no, no, I'm speaking first of a gravitational project process. And secondly, I now want to talk about the properties of the center of gravity with the understanding that it's never where the actual price is. OK? Any questions here? OK. So let me now come to um, the argument of the center of gravity. And I already touched on it with Smith. And Ricardo is going to pick up on it and elaborate on it. We're going to do it in two parts. The simple part that Ricardo talks about in um, uh, chapter one. And then the, uh, in the first three parts of chapter one, and then I'm going to pick up next time with a more complicated, elaborated version of his argument in chapter, in section four of chapter one. Uh, because the core of the whole thing is right there for price, as so that's concerned for price. So with this understanding, we're now talking about natural price, which is the the center of gravity. And so Ricardo is going to come up with first, let's call it the basic case, which is simple commodity production. He doesn't call it that. He, he speaks of it in terms of Adam Smith's rude and early state. But in Ricardo, it doesn't appear that he's talking about a historical state. He's talking about an analytical state. Because he wants to make a point about the determinants of um, natural prices. OK. So more than Smith, he lays out a specific argument, uh, numerical examples. And the argument boils down to the following proposition, which can be shown formally, mathematically, with linear algebra, with numbers. But the logic of it is the key point. And the logic of it is the following. Imagine that. Uh, every producer produced a product for sale. So you are all producers. Let's say this side of the room is uh, beaver, to use um, um, uh, Ricardo's example. Beaver producers, and this side of the room are deer hunters, beaver hunters and deer hunters. Ricardo says, well, OK, as Beaver hunters, you have to use some of your labor to make your tools. 
that's not necessary because you can have them made by other people, but it simplifies the argument at this stage, though it's easy to generalize, very easy to generalize. But let's suppose that you all, as beaver hunters, make traps for a certain amount of labor time, and then you use those traps to hunt um, beaver. And we can then figure out, because this example is simple, that the hours that you use to make the trap plus the hours you use to use a trap to get one beaver is the direct and indirect labor time for the beaver, right? Required to produce the beaver, the socially necessary labor time of the average group of you. Everybody understand that? So let's say on average it takes you um, um, 12 hours to make a trap. which gets used up in the process because you catch it, then you have to break the trap to get into the beaver, and uh, eight hours to catch a beaver. So it takes you 20 hours on average to catch one beaver for this group here. Everybody with me here? So we say that, let's say, um, 10 hours to make one trap, and one trap plus, um, no, I said 12 hours, sorry. Eight hours to produce one beaver. So the total labor time for one beaver is 20 hours. Okay, this is just a numerical example, but you illustrate the important point that you're not abstracting from uh, tools. Because you, tools are implicit, and by obvious by implication, raw materials and, and so on. The point of a good example is it should give you the general result with the simplest possible illustration. Right? Now let's suppose that you have also, uh, so this is beaver, beaver production, the beaver sector. So you have deer and um, did I bring the numbers with me? Yeah, I did. Um, you have um, six hours to produce bow and arrow. And a one bow and arrow. Plus... Uh, four hours to produce, to catch one deer. Okay? That means that the total labor time for one deer equals 10 hours. Okay, that's just an example, but you obviously, and if you are analytically inclined, I can substitute algebraic symbols for this, I can make the uh, input require the input and all of that, and um, we might do that more formally, but I don't want to do it here yet, but it's easy to do. But you can see clearly the meaning of the term direct and indirect labor time, right? And you can see that different elements, different products will have different direct and indirect labor times on average. Now, Smith's argument, and Ricardo formalizes it, and Marx picks it up, is that in this case, if these producers are simple commodity producers in the sense that they get to keep their income, from their labor, then the price, the natural price of these two will be in the same ratio as the labor times, direct and indirect labor time. In other words, it takes twice as much labor time to produce a beaver as a deer, and the natural price will be, therefore, uh, higher for beaver by the same ratio of two to one. Not the market price. The market price will be 
shooting up and down and supply and demand will adjust. If it's not equal to the natural price, people will move from one activity to another, but the natural price will be. And you can see this intuitively because if every hour of labor was paid the same income, not paid, but received the same income. If, in other words, you worked 20 hours and you sold the product in the market and you got $10 an hour, then here the price of this would be, the price which would give you the same income would be $200, right? If every hour earned 10 in this industry, then the price which would give you that would be 100. And it's clear that the ratio of the prices, which is 200 to 100, would be the same as 20 to 10. In other words, any position, any center of gravity in which different activities gave you the same earnings per hour would end up giving you prices which are proportional to the labor times. Does everybody see that logic? Yeah, I can do this more formally, but then I'd I need a little linear algebra or numerical example, which we'll provide you. But I, I want you, before the numerical example, to see, feel the logic of it. Because it's a very beautiful, simple logic. Okay, so let's say that the income per hour, let's say that the, the income per hour, let's call it the natural income to follow, is $10 per hour. That's income received from selling the, be the uh, deer and the beaver. It's not a wage because you're working for yourself. So what you get is what you get from selling the good, not from being paid by someone else. Everybody with me here? In case you ever end up unemployed and having to do work, you'll have to you get the satisfaction of knowing that you may or may not be getting the natural wage, but at least you have some idea what it is, right? Okay, so if this, if some process gives you roughly equal incomes per labor in the two sectors, then that process will create prices which will be in the same ratio as the labor times. And what is that process? Exactly the process that converts uh, any differences into some equality. In this case, if this side of the room got $11 an hour, the beaver sector, and this got $10 an hour, uh, $9 an hour, then some people on this side are likely to migrate. That's all you need, some migration. Uh, or people on this side are likely to hire some of their relatives or whatever to increase the supply. They take advantage of that too. It doesn't require movement across the sectors, it requires expansion of this sector and relative contraction here. So the price will come down, which means the income will come down. And here the price will go up, which means the income per hour will go up. Where's the balance point? When they have equal incomes per hour. And this is not because anybody says, oh, I would like equal incomes per hour. Everybody's saying the opposite. Oh, I would like more. But if there's competition, then the balance or the regulating point is equal incomes per hour. Okay? <clears throat> Any questions here? So this seems like a very simple point. Uh, it's not obvious, by the way, but at all. And it can be certainly formally uh, derived with the help of little linear algebra. But the point is something quite important because Smith and Ricardo and indeed Marx begins this way too, are not talking about this as some pre-capitalist state. Smith does. Smith says or makes it seem as if it used to belong to the past. Uh, Marx clearly does not. But think of this as an analytical stage. And what's the analytical stage? We've introduced competition and we've introduced equalization of income, so we've included mobility of labor from one activity to another. We've introduced natural prices and market prices, therefore, and natural incomes and market incomes, therefore. So a lot of things have been brought up, and we get a simple rule of exchange relative to direct and indirect labor time. 
That's the principle that Ricardo says is the fundamental principle of political economy, that the center of gravity of natural prices is direct and indirect labor time. Not necessarily, says, I don't mean that they're exactly equal, and I'm going to show you why it won't be exact, but this is the principal regulator. Now, any questions here? So now I can ask, well, yeah, but this is great, but this is about a analytical stage, if you want, or a historical stage in Smith, but so what's it got to do with capitalism? And that's the beauty of Smith's introduction, because Smith does this first, and of Ricardo's application to this. Both of them say, but look, if this $10 an hour, which is earned, uh, where did I put it, natural income, $10 an hour, is earned by the producers, in this process and that determines some relative prices. Now suppose that these producers had to share their income with the owners of their tools and the owners of the land or the river uh, or the uh, water in which they hunt beaver and the land on which they hunt deer. And the owners of these means of production were to say to them, uh, some of that money belongs to me and I demand some of it. So that means that we have now introduced class. Ownership of the means of production, ownership of the, uh, of the land. So we introduced a capitalist class and a landlord class. Smith says this quite explicitly. But he says, notice that this rule of price wouldn't have to change as long as each of the contending classes, the new classes, simply took proportions of this income. In other words, if they took a share which is proportional to what is now wage income. Once you introduce class, the beaver producer is not a private producer anymore, but a wage laborer. Right? Because otherwise you wouldn't be able to say that this belongs to me, that some of that income belongs to me. So Smith makes the leap from a private producer who owns his or her, 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 own means, her own means of production into a wage laborer. But his point is something deeper, which is that this leap, uh, this introduction of classes, need not change the rule of the price equalization process, of the center of gravity of market price. I'll come to you in a sec. So Smith is the first one to make this point, that I can introduce class into the story as long as I divide this into proportions of wages. So if the capitalist class were to say, look, we get 30% of whatever the income is, and the landlord class says we get another 20%, then these two classes now take 50% of what was previously, analytically, the uh, income entirely of the private producer. And it doesn't matter whether you change the technologies and all that, but the point would be that as long as these class divisions are proportional to the income of what is now the laborer, the income of the producer, then the rule of relative prices, of the center of gravity of relative prices, would be the same as before. That's clear because that wouldn't change the equality of the, of the value added. Right? And this is a very powerful point, and it's a point which has gotten lost in the literature because it's gotten lost because people jump from here to uh, unequal divisions, and they make it seem as if that's the essence of capitalism. But the essence of capitalism in Smith and Ricardo is not the inequality of the division, but the existence of it. So they have introduced class. They've included in the sense of Marx exploitation. They've transformed the producer into a wage labor, and yet the rule of price has not yet changed. Now, Smith says, but this rule will be changed in general because the amount that the capitalist will take of this $10 will not be proportional to the wage bill, but proportional to the capital owned by the capitalist. Now think about that. If in these two sectors, beaver and deer, the capital was proportional to wages in each, so the capital labor ratio is the same in each, 
then they would get the same profit rate from any proportion that they took. Because they have the same capital labor ratio, that means they get the same proportion of wages, but if the capital is proportioned to labor, that means the rate of return on capital will be the same in both sectors. Everybody see that? And should I do a numerical example? Yes, okay. So let's suppose that we now, for the sake of argument, we just have some, some amount of income at these original prices. So we have price um, of uh, beaver, price of deer, this is 200, this is 100. The income in beaver is 10 per hour, and the income in deer is 10 an hour, because that's a condition where the uh, mobility of labor will stop, mobility from one sector to another will stop, so it's a equal incomes. Now let's suppose that I divide these incomes into wages per hour, uh, which is, let's say, uh, um, uh, six, and profits per hour, I should write this out, wages per hour, wage per hour, and let's say it's four. I'm going to leave out land because obviously the principle is the same, so, and I can only divide things into two, num into two parts, so beyond that I get lost, so. Definitely, uh, we can extend the principle, and Smith actually uh, talks about all three, but in steps. Now, we've divided in each sector the previous $10 into two uh, in the same proportion. So, Let's suppose that the capital in um, uh, beaver and the capital in deer were such that, let's suppose this was 60, and this is uh, 60. If these had the capital per hour, by the way, It can be different amounts of capital, but it's a capital divided by the labor. So the capital labor ratio was 60 per hour. Uh, so let me write this as capital to labor and capital to labor. And this is 60 per hour of labor and this is 60 per hour of labor. Doesn't mean the amount is the same. The capital can be much bigger or lower, but relative to labor, the ratio is a, the number is the same. Well, then this is going to be a profit rate of profit per hour over capital per hour, which is 60, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, 6 over 60, and that's 10%. And obviously, here, you're going to find the same thing, RB and RD is going to be 6 over 60, which is 10 percent. How did I get to capital per hour? I just made it up. And the point is the following. I made it up in such a way that the ratios are the same. Because if they are the same, then an equal division of the value added in each sector would be also the same thing as an equal profit rate. Okay? I'm going to ask now, what if they're not the same? Where does that come from? How do you conceptualize that? Um, it, it could be uh, because, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. The way I set up the example, I don't have any room for capital per hour, but I could make it up in the following way.
I could say the traps are produced by labor which are sold at a price different than the... Indeed, yes. And strictly speaking, I would have to make up the numbers so they're proportional to 12, and, and these are different. So I'm, in effect, fudging the issue, and, and Smith does this too, to bring up a separate point, to arrive at the difference. If it so happened that the capital labor ratios were such that they were the same, these are ratios now, they were the same, then the same division of value added into profit and wages would give you the same profit rate in the two sectors, which would mean, from a capitalist point of view, there'd be no reason for new capital to enter uh, this sector or leave it because it would be the same as the other. So that means, and this is the key point, if the capital labor ratios were the same, these prices would also be competitive prices in a capitalist economy. Because remember, we started them as competitive prices in a non-capitalist economy. But then we divided the value added between labor and capital, and so that if the capital labor ratios were equal, then these would also be competitive prices in a uh, capitalist economy. Smith goes this far. He doesn't provide the numbers, but the logic is exactly in here. But then Smith says, but in general, we don't expect the capital labor ratios to be uh, equal. And indeed, we could figure them out from this example because we have 12 hours to make one trap. If we call that now the owner, the trap, owner of the trap, that's the capital they have, or the sum of their wages and trap, uh, um, uh, wages and uh, um, cost of the trap, and the bow and arrow price becomes a fixed capital in the story, then we might have different, we will have differences. And so that's Smith's point. Smith's point is that in general, uh, no, I'm sorry, let me finish this point. So here we've established that if the capital labor ratios are equal, then obviously it is not the existence of capitalism or the subordination of the private producer to wage as a, into a transformation into wage labor that causes prices to differ from relative labor times. What causes it to differ is a much more specific issue, not capitalism per se, but the inequality in the capital labor ratios, a technical condition, the specificity of the production structure and of the pricing structure, but not the existence of capitalism. So the deviation of prices from Ricardo's simple labor theory of price, or Smith's, is not due to the existence of capitalism or of competition. Both are already subsumed under here, but to the technical structure. And that raises an interesting question, which we are going to pursue in this class, uh, because that's Ricardo's question. Ricardo is the first one to point out that, yes, if you suppose that this was, uh, uh, I'm not going to say 70, let's say 66, and this is something also that I can divide by 6. Um, yeah, it's 33, whatever, but anyway, something, yeah. Then the profit rates here would be different, right? 66, so it's 1. Tenth, uh, one eleventh. It should be four, right? I'm sorry. Profit, profit starts four. Profits. Ah, uh, yes, you're right. Profit. Absolutely. So, change, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Let's just, let's just change this around because, as I said, more than two numbers, and as it turns out, even two numbers uh, <laughs> beyond my capacity. Um, yes, that's right. Thank you. Um, so you can see the profit rates will now be different because you have. 33, and I don't know what it is, but I think it's 1 over 22, whatever that percentage is. And they're clearly unequal. That's a key point, right? They're unequal. But that raises a very important question, which is going to be the question that Ricardo is going to pick up. We're going to do in his numerical example. He is going to say, Smith is right, that the rule that was derived in the simple case does not carry over. It is, as he puts it, modified considerably modified. But he's not satisfied with saying it's modified. 
he wants to make a deeper argument that it is a disturbance term, to use a, a modern term, that the dominance of this relative direct and indirect labor times remains, but there is now an additional element due to the differences. Now, if you approach it that way, and I will approach it that way, because that's how it appears in Smith, in Ricardo, you then raise a very interesting question, which is, how big and why are the differences in capital labor ratios among sectors? That's a theoretical question, first of all. And it's also an empirical question. You can answer it theoretically, you can pause it theoretically, but ultimately you have to test it empirically, and we're going to do that. Ricardo implicitly argues something different. So here, Ricardo is, uh, this is Smith's argument, and Ricardo is bringing us to this point. So now Ricardo says, now the relative prices, and remember these are the center of gravity prices, not the market prices, is a function of the uh, direct and, I'm going to use the symbol lambda for direct and indirect labor time. So uh, total labor time here is lambda b, and this is lambda d, direct and indirect labor time, because that appears in the literature when you, in some literature. So it's going to be a function of these two labor times and something else. Let's call that a disturbance term. Now viewed this way, it's a function of two things, the direct and indirect labor times and the deviations caused by the deviations of capital labor ratios. Okay? And so now we've come to a rather critical point, which is almost entirely neglected in any discussions of Ricardo, which is that Ricardo argues that this is the dominant term in the following sense. Ricardo says that the r rate of change, I'm going to use the symbol to mean the rate of change, percentage rate of change. So that's over time now, looking at it in two different time periods. He's going to say that this is approximately equal to the rate of change. Well, I'm sorry, let me back up a bit. I, I apologize, I, I skipped a little too fast. He's going to make two propositions out of this. At any moment of time, the dominant element is the labor time. I've written approximately because obviously the, this is not exactly equal because there's a disturbance term. Ricardo makes an argument that the sensitivity, and this is really tricky, exactly a sensitivity analysis, of relative prices with respect to the factors that cause this to vary, which is a distribution between wages and profits. So I make these wages 5 and this 5, then this deviation will change. If I make this 6 and 4, the deviation will change, and so on. If a profit goes to 0, then prices will go back to exactly equality with relative labor times. You can work this out yourself if you play around with these numbers, right? So the key point that Ricardo makes is that the relative prices are uh, not very sensitive to fluctuations in this thing, and therefore they're going to be close to, in some sense, uh, the relative labor times. And this is his famous 7% argument which we're going to look at in detail next time. I want to set up the reason for the argument. The reason being that he wants to establish what he said right from the beginning, as you read, that the principle that's most important in political economy is that the relative prices are regulated by labor time. And this is a principle. And then he goes on to say, and that also, this is Ricardo's first hypothesis, and then there's a second hypothesis that the rate of change, 
of relative prices is approximately equal to the rate of change of the relative labor times. In other words, if I look over time to see why price of something is falling, I should be looking, I would find that it's largely driven over long periods of time by the changes in relative labor times directly and indirectly. And since labor time, direct and indirect, is a measure of productivity. It's the reverse of the productivity. Labor time is labor over output. Productivity is output over labor. So that's saying that it would be driven by productivity change. And that's something we can actually test, and we will test empirically. That relative prices are largely driven by productivity change. And that any moment of time, relative prices are largely determined by direct and indirect labor times. Now, Ricardo couldn't test this because there was no such thing as data that could do this. The data invented to do this was, um, the data necessary to do it was essentially invented in the 1930s and 1940s in the Soviet Union because of their use of plans and was brought over from the Soviet Union by Leontief, who left the Soviet Union, went to Germany, worked with Adolf Lowe, who hired him as his research assistant. Adolf Lowe was my mentor at the New School when he came to New Jer uh, from uh, Germany to New York. And Lowe hired this young kid called Leontief, who got a Nobel Prize in economics for this work, and among other things, setting up the input-output tables and the computer techniques for calculating this number. So not something that could have been done before, but it could have been understood before. It couldn't have been estimated before, but it could have been understood. And it was already understood in Ricardo. So you see, all we've done is talk about the first 15 or 20 pages in Ricardo so far today. But there lies a very powerful question about the structure of capitalist pricing. And we're going to look, as we proceed in the course, at the empirical evidence. But first, we need to do a little bit more about the logic of these two arguments. I've laid them out generally, but it's very good to see the numerical example, Ricardo, to get some feel for it. It's, I would argue, a very sophisticated mathematical analysis, which has been lost to most people, but not to one mathematician by the name of Jacob Schwartz, who was at the Courant Institute at NYU who wrote a little book, and you will be, it's in your readings, a little section of the book in which he addresses this question and makes a test of it empirically. A test which is so simple and so beautiful that any one of us can do it with existing data. So to understand that, we're going to pick it up next time. Ricardo's 93% theory of price. It's a 7% theory of this disturbance term. And that's the upper limit, by the way, 7% max. Yes? Now, does, he, does he or anybody else break down, the, break down the indirect and direct labor time contribution? Because he does say that in the direct case, the entirety of the, the labor would fall on that good, whereas the other one would be, the indirect labor would be distributed on that good and every other good that it touched. Yes. Uh, in fact, he will, we will see that he'll provide a numerical example, as I did here, by the way. I mean, this is a numerical example of the indirect labor time. I could make the example more complicated by saying, let's assume that this is another producer. Then this producer has to have income proportional to the labor time that she spent in making a trap. And this producer, uh, income proportional to the labor time spending in bows and arrows. And I advise you to do that. It's a simple extension of this. You can quickly see that a number will make all of these prices equal to the labor times, and that number is when they get the same income. That won't tell you what the income is, but it'll tell you it has to be the same. You can pick 20, 10, whatever. As long as it's the same in every sector, you'll see that all prices will be proportional to labor time. And if this price is proportional to labor time, then the second sector has a cost equal to the cost of the trap plus the cost of labor. Uh, and plus uh, living labor and therefore an income, a value added, which is over the cost, depending on the price. And you can easily set up a little spreadsheet example, plug in any numbers you want. You will see that only equal incomes will give you, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, only uh, uh, when incomes are equal, 
prices will have to be proportional to labor time, which is Ricardo's point. Now, we can make the example more and more complicated. For that, you need a little, uh, you need to either be able to solve simultaneous equations, or my preference is linear algebra because that's a nice way to collect all of this stuff in one, and you can see the solution straightforward. But you can also do it in simultaneous equations. Yeah. The second hypothesis of Ricardo is relating to related to the variations. Can you yes. can you repeat it? Yes. The the first hypothesis says that the this disturbance term contributes about seven percent max. By implication, the other contributes about ninety three percent. But the second hypothesis is a, is a hypothesis that doesn't require the disturbance term, technically speaking, to be small. It only requires it to be relatively stable over time. Because if it was 20%, then even if the relative disturbance term didn't change very much, then the other part would dominate. And so when asked these questions mathematically, we can ask these questions empirically. But the point is they were there already a long time ago and have been lost. I actually ran into this question by myself by accident, because I used to teach trade theory here. And one day I was teaching the section on Ricardo, uh, on uh, Leontief's famous Leontief paradox article in uh, critique of the Heck-Schorlein model. And in order to do that, I was looking at the back of his paper, and he had listed all these numbers. And I was looking at the numbers, and I became very excited because these numbers looked like they had a pattern to me. Though I've, other people have looked at them and said they didn't have a pattern, at least to them. But what the numbers were were the number were the ratio of the price to the direct and indirect labor time, P over lambda, in every sector for 182 sectors in the US economy. And so I got very excited, and I thought, well, how do I figure out if these are uh, satisfying or not? I realized I could get the prices, because they were there, so I just had to figure out how to multiply these numbers. Now, 182, in those days, we didn't have computers. So I went to the new school and I said, I need my computer account because I have this. And they said, we don't do computers at the new school. We just think about philosophy and, you know, but no computers. So a friend of mine by the name of Sheldon Danziger at MIT, was a graduate student, took my data, ran it through the MIT computer, and we separated out these two variables and we plotted them. And you'll see the plot next time. So see you next week.